Dead to the World delves into the backstory behind Lucas Buck and cinches another knot in his ties to Gale. It's also an episode that demonstrates just how slippery Lucas can be, even when you have him dead to rights. In a flashback, Lucas does the creepy flirty thing with Holly Gallagher, played by The Walking Dead's Melissa McBride. Fred, you're under arrest. On what charge? Stealing my heart. They go for a ride in her car, but she quickly gets angry when he says that he'll be dropping her off that night. As Caleb's neonatal nurse, she quickly puts together that he's been pumping her for information about the Temple baby. She also figures out that Lucas is the baby's father, to which Lucas responds by driving them off a bridge into the river. Fast forward to present day Trinity, where Caleb and Boone are practicing for the local archery contest. Boone is better than Caleb, so Sheriff Buck intervenes to give Caleb some pointers. Well, he's the best. Best man don't always win. He bullies Caleb into shooting a live crow and then tells him that no one can be pushed into doing something they didn't want to do anyway. I don't want that thing. What do you mean? You kill it, you own it. You made me. So nobody makes anybody do anything they don't want to do in the first place. A frustrated Caleb runs off and says he doesn't want to hear from Buck ever again. Meanwhile, Gail finds Holly's mom in hopes of tracking down Holly for more information. But Holly's mom tells her that Holly died. Mom's cryptic musing about Holly's potential creeps Gail out, though. Left alone in Holly's room, Gail's inner reporter comes out, and she goes through Holly's old love letters to find some written by Lucas Buck. Mrs. Gallagher says Holly wasn't seeing anyone serious when she died, but Gail can tell that she's hiding something. Merlin pays Caleb another visit and warns Caleb to accept the part of him that will always be influenced by Lucas. Caleb admits that that's a part of himself that he's scared by, and Marley says she is too. We finally get expanded character development for Deputy Ben as he visits his ex-wife Barbara Joy, who is busy repainting a racist lawn jockey. It ain't PC. <laughs> she implies that she's just doing it because the PC police are bullying their son Benji at school. But hey, as I just learned from Lucas Buck, no one does anything they don't want to do. So she probably knew it was racist all along. Ben has come to warn her new husband Waylon to keep his hands to himself where Barbara Joy and Benji are concerned. Viewers from a rural background should be able to clock exactly what kind of abusive bully Waylon Flood is. The kind that excuses his abuse of women and children through patriarchal domain or biblical home correction, when all he really wants to do is beat women and children. Waylon has no respect for Ben, so he sucker kicks him in the testicles right in front of his son, tosses him out. Ben winds up looking rather pathetic in front of his ex-wife and son. We also catch up with Deputy Floyd, whose role in the story is usually to reinforce the whole Mayberryness of it all. What is that eight-letter word for snoop? Intruder? Has to end in a Y. Reach for the stars, Floyd. Gail wanders in to press Lucas about his relationship with Holly, but he downplays it and laments the fact that they could never find her body. You were seeing her when she died. Jealous? Deputy Ben comes in nursing his wounds, interrupting them. Floyd, I believe I found your magic word. What's that? Busy buddy. Lucas warns Ben to fix the situation because it reflects badly on Lucas. Not surprisingly, he shows very little sympathy for Ben. Can't we all just get along? The antebellum culture motif continues with my favorite bit player moment in the show. As Selena is teaching the class about nonviolence, she cites Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Civil War General Robert E. Lee. Rachel Seidman Lockamy, in her only appearance as Caleb's classmate Charlotte, does the skeptical look of a well read student who smells bullshit. Selena explains that Robert E. Lee only fought because he was pushed. Nobody makes anybody do anything they don't want to do in the first place. Selena keeps Boone after school, preventing him from going to practice with Caleb. Sheriff Buck shows up with a brand new aluminum bow to replace the simple one left to Caleb by his father. Elsewhere, Gail has commissioned a diving team to find Holly's car. And it turns out the car is only under about 15 feet of water, which means they must have not tried too hard to find it the first time. We get a nice callback as Barnaby Carpenter returns as TJ, the innocent kid who inherited the junkyard in the previous episode. When Gail opens the car door, there's no body, but an examination of the seat and the gas pedal shows that Holly wasn't driving. At practice, Coach Lucas tries to give Caleb that winner's edge, which is accurate to life for anyone who has ever been in competitive sports. But it's hard not to notice that he sounds like a paranoid sociopath. Picture Boone's face up there on that target. If he was really your friend, would he want to humiliate you in front of all those people tomorrow? He's your enemy, Caleb. Never forget that. On the street, in competition, a man confronts you, he's the enemy. An enemy deserves no mercy. What is the problem, Mr. Lawrence? Dr. Matt finds Deputy Ben and tells him that Barbara Joy came into the hospital with some bruises. Matt suggests that Ben talk to his son about how to treat women. 
Ben laments that Barbara Joy and Benji just don't have respect for him, but Matt tells him that this could be the chance to change that. The scene is clumsy and on the nose. They have to get Ben the information and motivation to get to the final scene, but having Dr. Matt go to him directly in violation of Barbara Joy's privacy rights seems simultaneously out of character and preachy. This is the same problem that plagued Damned If You Don't. The female character who is the actual victim of the violence recedes into the woodwork, and the story presents it as a transgression against the male character. The scene is saved, though, by the fantastic performances from Nick Searcy and Jake Weber. If nothing else, both actors fully understand their characters only five episodes into this show. Gail makes a nuisance of herself by telling Mrs. Gallagher what she found, but Mrs. Gallagher gets the convenient deus ex machina phone call and tells Gail to leave. In a polite southern fashion, of course. Gail, ever the busybody, picks up the phone when the place calls back and finds out that it's a sanitarium. Deputy Ben shows up at Waylon's house and apologizes to Benji for allowing the abuse to go on so long. Waylon is about to clock him with a chair leg before he sees Lucas pull up in the distance. Waylon backs off, giving Deputy Ben the win, but Lucas pulls up again after he's gone and Waylon is so freaked out that he stumbles right into the circular saw. Gail pops up at the sanitarium and finds Holly, and Holly won't shut up about Lucas Buck. He's here. Lucas, of course, shows up and explains that he kept Holly a secret out of respect for her mother, who sunk into denial at the thought of Holly never living up to her potential. Buck offers to show Gail what really happened that night, so he takes her on a ride out to the bridge, speeding with his eyes closed. Gail gets nervous and nearly spins him off the bridge into the river. This explanation lays the accident and Holly's condition at her own feet. Lucas says she wanted to kill them both because she was a romantic. Of course, we know that this is a lie, but it's enough to get Gail to doubt her instincts. Lucas then plants a creepy kiss on her. The big day of the archery contest comes, and of course it comes down to Caleb and Boone. Caleb is shocked to find out that Boone would be just as happy if Caleb won because they're friends. It's okay. We're both in the lead. But don't you want to win? Of course. But if I don't, you win. It's just as good. Ooh, oh. Yes. Yes. Ben and Benji have a touching reunion where Benji thanks him for standing up for them. Caleb returns the bow to Buck and uses his old bow. Boone winds up winning and the two friends make up. Merle looks on from the trees with pride. Gail gives Mrs. Gallagher a sermon on how to treat her daughter, which reunites the Gallaghers and Lucas and Selena have kinky 1990s wax melty sex in her classroom. And we're out. There's a lot to like in this episode. Caleb's struggle is internal with the sheriff pulling him one way and his experiences with others pulling him the other. Even though Merle does briefly reappear to grimace and cross her arms, it doesn't come across as Buck vs. Merlin the same way that other episodes do. This is purely Caleb vs. himself. The B story with Ben, while fairly shallow and problematic, does its job. Deputy Ben George McFly's his way to respectability in the eyes of his ex-wife and son, with his willingness to stand up for them and their relationship improves because of it. Of course, Waylon's real source of fear isn't Ben, but Sheriff Buck, which he openly tells Ben at one point. You tell Sheriff Buck, I appreciate the warning, and I won't ever lay a hand on Barbara Joy again. The framing of the scene is excellent, as Ben never actually sees Lucas pull up, so there's a sort of plausible deniability in what happens to Waylon. More on that in a bit. Ben is a fascinating character in that he's the first character we meet that expresses unease with Lucas's methods while still accepting the benefits. We later meet a number of people who are in the same boat, including Judge Halpern and even Selina at times. But Ben is the first and the one that we spend the most time with. We later learn that this dichotomy is taking a larger toll on Ben that he's let on, and it's not hard to imagine that his coward in a bully speech is really directed at the man who is looking over his shoulder the whole way. I'm afraid your stepfather here is a coward. He thinks that the way to control people is by bullying them. One of my favorite aspects of this episode is how much of the culture of Trinity gets expanded. From the deputies having a lazy day, to the Robert E. Lee lesson, to the archery contest, to a woman arguing with Ben about her kid's dental work. No, no, I would not advise trying to take the braces off yourself. Trinity feels like it's alive and not just a backdrop for the main cast exploits. And that brings me to the overarching theme of the show, one that I opted not to cover in my Why You Should Watch American Gothic video. American Gothic, whether intentional or not, is about life under fascism. That's a word that gets overused online and in most political debates, but it objectively applies to Trinity. Most of the townspeople know that something isn't right. There's a large number of missing people, strange accidents happening, and unexplained deaths. But they either A, don't speak out for fear of reprisal, or B, benefit from the arrangement in some way. Lucas controls or at least influences most of the institutions in Trinity. The lone exception, of course, is the hospital. And that's only because Dr. Matt stands in his way, something that will come to a head in future episodes. 
For the most part, the people of Trinity just appreciate that the trains run on time. A reference to Mussolini's fascist government and one that a character will make a direct reference to in a few episodes. They're indebted to Lucas for straightening out bureaucratic snafus or pulling favors for them. How's the job working out, Dean? I don't know what you said, but the station's off me a hell of a deal. There any other kind? <laughs> so they don't question the missing people, the strange accidents, or the unexplained deaths. Helped out a lot of folks in this town. This is represented in Holly Gallagher's mother Janice, who would rather hide her daughter away in a sanitarium and pretend she died rather than acknowledge an unfair, random, and imperfect world in which bad things happen to good people. Even her cosmetics business, which leans heavily on color analysis, is described as people trying to be perfect. I've covered this in my Dallas analysis, but in a good show, one-off or bit characters will interact in the main narrative, either contrasting or reinforcing the main thesis of the episode. Janice Gallagher's willingness to shove her own daughter under the rug perfectly demonstrates the collective will of Trinity to avoid talking about problems in their town. This lack of introspection allows Lucas to run roughshod over individuals. The interesting thing about this is that this is also the deal that the audience makes with the character of Lucas. Gary Cole is incredibly charming in the role, and as we've seen in the past two episodes, his powers are often directed at people who quote-unquote deserve it, an implied child molester and a wife beater. It's easy for the audience to root for Lucas in these episodes because we hate the actions of the characters he's pitted against. American Gothic predates The Sopranos by nearly half a decade, but it's not hard to see Lucas Buck and J.R. Ewing before him as a sort of template for writing the charming sociopath that would later be picked up in Dexter and Breaking Bad. What's interesting is that the show also undercuts Buck's cutthroat message with Caleb's main story, making Buck a benevolent presence in one story thread and the bad guy in another. We're meant to see Caleb's ultimate rejection of Buck's hypermasculine, hypercompetitive approach as a win, as evidenced by Merlin's reaction. The episode itself is entertaining. The bad guy gets his comeuppance, Ben gets an arc, Gale solves a mystery, Caleb maintains his integrity. The breeziness of the various plot threads makes it easy to forgive some of the convenient liberties that the story takes to get there. Dead to the World is a quintessential American Gothic episode, so if you're not on board at this point, the show probably just isn't for you. Next up, an episode so bizarre it didn't even air in the show's initial run. 